All right, welcome everybody. It's good to see you guys. Good to have you here. Wow, good turnout today. And uh, we're going to continue on, as we've said, into our series. But it is our joy and our, our honor to be able to host you guys today. I want to also take a moment to welcome everybody watching us right now at Facebook Live, TurningPointChurch.tv, and also our Covington Campus launch team is watching us right now. Turning Point, let's say hello to our Turning Point fam online. God bless you guys. We love you. And uh, we're having a lot of fun. God's doing some powerful things because we're not just having fun, but we're experiencing God's presence and God's word and God's power. And I'm believing that he's going to continue on as we, we've talked about this I of the 90s and really the ideas just to reminisce about maybe that, that decade um, and, and maybe some things that make you smile and you go, oh, yeah, I remember that. But, m but more than that, um, I'm taking some music from the 90s and bringing forth messages because I, I love music and I'm sure you probably do too. But I, I hear redemptive stuff through movies and music and uh, that's why we have stuff like this um, because cause God just kind of puts an impression in my heart and and today's uh, song, as you heard, uh, Jason Fowler and Turning Point Worship did such an excellent job with the 1998 hit by the Goo Goo Dolls called Iris. Iris, maybe you don't know what a Goo Goo Doll is. You thought that was a candy or something, but it was actually a, <laughs> it was actually a band and they did this song. And what stuck out to me was uh, the line in that song is, is it just was, I don't know, I guess it was 1998. So I was serving the Lord. Uh, I was a youth pastor, but I remember hearing the song at the gym. And just that line where it says, I don't want the world to see me. Um, everything's made to be broken. I just want you to know who I am. And I'm sure the author of, and the writer of that song had his application for that. But when I heard that, it's as if I heard kind of like God singing to the world. Everything's made to be broken. But it's made to be broken so that you can know who I am. In other words, the Ten Commandments that he gave us, God never expected or believed that we would keep those. Because there's no way. No one has ever done that. I haven't, and neither have you. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all transgressed God's standard. And that is uh, the commandments, which is, which is why they were made to be broken, so that we could see our need for a Savior. That's why God sent his son Jesus, who came as the God-man, fully God, fully man. He carried out the law. He fulfilled the commandments, and he lived the perfect life, which is what qualified him to go to the cross for all of us who didn't live a perfect life. And he who knew no sin became sin, the, the righteous for the unrighteous, and he took our place on the cross and took the penalty and the judgment that we deserve, and he took our place. He was buried and rose again, all because God... God wanted us to know him. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's not just a, a way. He is the way. Can I have a better amen? He's not just a way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. But I, I love this because Jesus comes and he's God's son. And in the Old Testament, um, God was, had all these incredible names, El Shaddai, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah you know, Nisi, and, and just all these incredible names that, that he was known by. But in the New Testament, really, it gets a little bit more intimate. He, he wants to be known as Father. And that's why Jesus came as his son. He was, he was buried and rose again to be the firstborn among many brethren. God wanted sons and daughters in the earth, and that's why he sent Jesus. And the good news, the gospel is this. According to John 1.12, to everyone who accepted him and believed in him, he gave the right to become a child of God. What an incredible promise and opportunity that we can have the, 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 the promise to become a child of God. And by the way, there's no greater title in the universe than son or daughter. And Jesus came as God's son and he, it says that all who accepted and believed. And sometimes you know, when we think about that song, Iris, Iris meaning the eye, the, the, the part of the eye where you can see. And when I thought about that idea that many times people can struggle serving and worshiping and living for a God that they've never seen. But Jesus told Thomas, he said, blessed are you uh, for you have seen, but truly blessed are those who have never seen and believed. And we have bouts with doubt. I think all of us do. We have bouts with doubt. But some people, they actually believe in the, the lie that there is no God. But the Bible is clear that creation testifies of a creator. 
um, you may have never seen the builder of this building. But you probably believe there was a builder even though you never saw it. And we can look at creation, and though we've never seen the designer, we can believe there had to be a creator. There's no way that just, this just happened. In fact, science proves the likeliness of everything that's evolved into what it is or has become what it is through creation, the likeliness that it evolved from nothing or some slime or some goo that came out of a swamp is the same chances as if uh, a tornado went through a junkyard and produced a 747. There had to be a designer, everybody. And even though there's a God you've never seen, you need to know today there is a God who sees you. And he believes in you. It reminds me of a guy who was um, an atheist walking through the, the forest of the Rocky Mountains. And um, he was admiring creation, the, the trees and the birds and the, the, the stream. And just really kind of uh, praising, if you will, um, creation's evolution. And, you know, he, he believed that it just kind of evolved. And he's walking through, comes around a corner. And just before the stream, at the bend of the corner, there is a grizzly bear. And the grizzly bear notices him and realizes there's something fresh on the menu now. Wasn't in the mood for any more fish. So he stands up, and, and, and the guy, you know, you're told uh, if you ever encounter a bear, you're supposed to stand your ground. I'm like, yeah, right. Uh-huh. So he takes off running. Bear chases him. He trips, he falls, he turns around, he looks, and the bear is about to slice him and dice him with those claws. And just before he does, he cries out, oh God, no! And the bear freezes. The trees stop moving. Time stops. The river stops moving. The birds stop singing. A light shines down from heaven and says, so you don't believe that I exist. You've even taught other people that I don't exist. You believe that Nature is some result of a cosmic mystery. And now in your moment of need, you want me to rescue you. Is this right? Is this what you're asking me? God thinks about it. He's like, you know what? No. I won't be a hypocrite. I will not ask you to help me. I'm not going to ask you to make me a Christian. But I will ask you to make the bear a Christian. <laughs> he thought he was smart. How many of you know when you play chess with God, you... You get checkmated. So the bear became a Christian. The birds start singing. The river starts flowing. Time begins to move again. The bear brings his paw down. Joins it to the other one. Bows his head. He says, Father, I thank you for providing this meal today. May it nourish my body in Jesus' name. <laughs> now, I'm not advocating that God doesn't like atheists and he wants them eaten by bears. What I'm saying is that God doesn't believe in atheists and he loves atheists. And so do we, by the way. We, we love people. But sometimes we struggle because we don't see God. And I want to look today in Scripture as we understand an attribute of God that even though we don't see him, he sees us. And that he's a good father. He's a good God. And sometimes we get stuck in that because we think if he's so good, why is life so hard? If he's so good, why do bad things happen? If he's so good, then why are things so bad? And, and I think... The thing I love about the Bible is that when you really read it, and by the way, I, I highly recommend the Bible. It's the number one bestseller of all time. You should read. It's incredible. And the thing I love about it is it doesn't hide the fact that there's going to be struggles and challenges. It doesn't sugarcoat the people in it. It shows you their struggles. It shows you their doubts. It shows you their weaknesses. It even shows you their failures. But it also, also shows you the redemptive stories. Sometimes we get so hung up in the scriptures of, uh, even in creation and in Genesis, 
It, it talks a little bit about creation and how it happened. And the rest of the book is about fallen man who has sinned against a holy God. And the rest of the story is about how this holy God is going to pursue unworthy man so that he can reconcile and restore them back to himself. The good news is, is that God wants you to know that there are going to be struggles. But even in your struggle, he is your source of hope. He's your source of strength. Job said it like this. He said how short life is, how, how, how frail it is. It's full of trouble. Jesus echoed in John 16. He said that you're going to have tribulations. So I want to make sure that you are clear about this Jesus of the New Testament. And, and, and at turning point, may you understand that, that when we come to Jesus, that Jesus is not a life enhancement. He, he, he's not like, take, take this pill and everything's going to be all right. No, what it means is that the good news is, is that you can be forgiven, you can become God's child, you can become God's son, God's daughter, and you're going to have ch challenges, you're going to have tests, you're going to have trials, but be of good cheer because Jesus, your Lord, has overcome, and greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And so he's going to develop you into a conqueror, to an overcomer. And isn't it easy? To sing about being an overcomer. But we can't be an overcomer unless there's something to overcome. But sometimes when we're in the struggle, we feel isolated, we feel alone, we feel forgotten, we feel forsaken. We even feel invisible. But I've got good news for you. No matter how bad it is today, no matter how bad your problem, how complicated, how dark, how ugly, how twisted. You may feel like you're, you're hopeless but I want to remind you that there is a God who sees you. And if he sees you, he can help you. Listen, if he got a dead man out of the grave, don't you know he can get you out of anything? If he got two million people through the Red Sea, don't you know he can open up anything and get you through it? If he opened blind eyes, don't you know he can open anything? If he brought water from a rock, don't you know he can do anything? Nothing is too hard for the Lord. So be encouraged today to know that even in your struggle, there's a God who sees you. And there's a God who cares for you. Because sometimes I think when we have problems, I don't like problems. I, I don't like struggles. I don't like challenges. I don't like tests. I don't like conflict and tension. You know, like, man, I didn't come to church for you to tell me life's going to be hard. I got problems and struggles. Could you be more positive? I came for a positive message. Okay, I'm positive. You're going to have struggles and challenges and problems. But the good news is, is there's a God who sees you and comforts you. And not only is he in front of you or, or for you, he's in you. And he is working some things. Even when you can't see him working, he's working some things out. Uh, I was thinking about Linus from Charlie Brown. You know, Linus had a theology about problems. So I, I, I would say don't follow the theology and philosophy of Linus. Linus said, I believe the best way to handle a problem is to avoid it. No problem is too big or complicated that it can't be run from. I thought that was funny. But see, many times we run from the problem because we don't believe there's a solution. We think it's too hard. But we know that God who sees us can help us. And when we understand that God is with us and for us and that he sees us, even in our problem, when it seems like it's too big for us, our problem is never too big for God. In fact, it's just the right size for God. Boy, that's good. I like that. That's tweetable. And your problem may be big, but you can never have a problem too big for God. In other words, you'll never hear God say, man, I don't know what you've done now, but I don't know how we're going to get out of this one. You might as well give up. You'll never hear God say that because nothing is impossible for the God who sees you. He will never forsake you. You are not forgotten. You are not invisible. And even though you don't see him, he sees you. David prayed this prayer. In Psalm 18, he said, keep me as the apple of your eye. Keep me as the apple 
of your eye, the center part of your focus. Hagar, a lady named Hagar in in Genesis 16, had an encounter with God. And she said this, that you are the God who sees me. That's what she named him. El Roi, I think, is the technical name. The God who sees me. David said, keep me as the apple. So there's something, there's a theme in scripture that, that we need to hear today. Is that even though you don't see God, he sees you. He knows your tears, he knows your challenges, he knows your struggles. He knows the very number of hairs on your head. Or the lack thereof. He knows everything about you. And why is it, by the way, guys, fellas, why is it that we seem to lose the hair from the top of our head and it ends up on our back somehow as we age? I don't know, but I'm sorry, that's a random thought. Let me bring that squirrel back in here. But God knows everything about you. The scripture said that he even bottles your tears. Think about that. Man. Keep me as the apple of your eye. In um, Hebrew culture, as I began to dig into that a little bit, the apple of your eye, the iris, hence the name of the song. The iris. It's the place that light enters. It's, it's the most important part of the eye. If the iris gets messed up, you, you, it's, it's not a good thing. And that's why God, when he created you, he instinctively created some involuntary uh, reflexes and muscles to protect your eye before you could even think about it. That's why you have eyelids and eyelashes. That's why if someone comes at your eye, what do you do? You're, you're, you're like, hey, whoa, oh, no, I was just going to touch your face. Wait, watch out. It's just this instinctive thing that we have. To guard our eye. It's the apple. Another um, expression connected with the apple of the eye in the Hebrew culture was, it was called the little man of the eye. And it made a lot of sense because I remember when my children were much younger, I would bring them in and get close to their face. um, And I would say, what do you see? What do you see when you look in my eyes? And they're like, brown, daddy. I'm like, no, (laughs) look closer. And as they stared a little closer, they would see a little reflection in my iris. And it was of them. Isn't that amazing? And it's like, yeah, you're the center of daddy's eye. You're the apple of daddy's eye. And God wants you to know as his son and daughter in Christ, you're the apple of his eye. That you're the center of his focus. And that he instinctively protects and guards and covers you even in your struggle. He will never abandon you. Even when you don't see him, he is still watching out for you. Even when you don't know it, he is still protecting you. When that car should have hit you, when you should have died from that disease, when you could have been taken out, when when you should have not, it was God. I'm sure all of us can look back in hindsight and thought, man, there were several times I should have died. But I didn't. And now I look back and now I realize it was the love of God. Even when I wasn't pursuing him, he was still watching after me and watching over me. Because he was the God who saw me even when I was sinning and running against him. Aren't you glad today that God loves you and sees you despite your failures, your mistakes, and even your sin? I'm so thankful. So when we think about the struggle, the struggle is real. Hashtag the struggle is real. When I think about the struggle, you would think maybe I would give you strategies for winning. Because that's what we want to do. At Turning Point, we want to give you life application. Uh, I want to encourage you, inspire you. But I've always wanted to make sure I put some tools, resources, and some how-tos in your hand so that you can actually live out and bring some resolve and put these things into practice. And uh, I would give you a strategy for winning. But, you know, sometimes we don't just need strategies for winning. We need strategies for losing. In the struggle. So today I thought I would give you strategies for the struggle. Strategies for the struggle. Because we're going to have struggles. But the good news is this. Is that because you know there is a God, an everlasting loving God, an almighty God. Because you know he's watching you. He sees you. You can follow this 
path that we see in the life of a guy named Joseph. Man, I really hope they make a great movie about the story of Joseph. I think it's probably next to David my favorite story in all of the Old Testament. There's something about Joseph's story, his, his, his stamina, his swag. His, just, he's incredible. And Joseph is 17 years old. God gives him this dream. And his father had given him this coat of many colors. He was actually, the Bible says... Um, his father's favorite son, which is why parents, we can never favor a child because it never ends well when we do that. But his father favored him, gave him this multicolored jacket. Maybe it was a Gucci, I don't know. But it was multicolored. His brothers hated him for it. Joseph shares this dream and vision that God given to, given to him. Perhaps he shared it in pride, I don't know. He was young. Maybe he came across as arrogant and cocky. But his brothers didn't like it. They despised him all the more. And they saw an opportunity one day to get rid of him. They were going to kill him, but instead they pushed him into a pit. They pushed him into a pit and they said, you know what, maybe we won't kill him. <laughs> How sweet. Let's sell him. So they sold him as a slave. He goes into Egypt as a slave and uh, works for a guy named Potiphar, serve a guy named, serves a guy named Potiphar, uh, does really well. Potiphar's house begins to prosper. And the Bible says the favor of the Lord was with Joseph. And it's because the favor wasn't on the coat, it was on the person. Aren't you thankful today for the favor of God? The favor that will follow you into your struggle. So he, he, he's there serving. He gets wrongly accused of going after Potiphar's wife. And uh, he's... He's now a prisoner, so he gets sent to prison. So it's pit, slave, prison. But ultimately, he, he, he meets a couple of guys in prison. He helps them out, and um, he says, hey, uh, remember your boy. When you go back, uh, let, let Pharaoh know who I am. By the way, I'll just throw this in. Joseph spent two more years in prison. And could it be God wanted him to know? You don't have to name drop for me to get you to your place of promotion and blessing. I think I'll let you simmer here for a couple of more years so that when I do promote you, you'll know that it was me and not you. I don't know who that was for, but that's just good. Come on, high five somebody and tell them that was good. That was good. You needed to hear that. I don't know. That wasn't for me. Or if you're thinking about that person you wish was here, you ever do that? Boy, I wish so and so was here. Well, guess what? They're not you are. Could be it's for you. Not, not them, but I'm, I'm just saying. So here's our strategy. So he gets promoted to Pharaoh, Sir Pharaoh, the king. So he lives in this place of victory and fulfillment. And, man, he, he serves the Pharaoh's dream and purpose with all of his heart. And he lives in victory the rest of his days. So good. So let's look at, at this pattern because Joseph had a struggle. At 13, I'm sorry, at 17, he gets this dream. And then 13 years of struggle. But he ended up victorious. So let's, let's look at this strategy for the struggle. If you want to take notes, here's the first one. In the struggle, you've got to surrender to the God who sees you. Surrender. I've noticed when I struggle to surrender, it's an issue of trust or control. And the pit represents surrender because he's pushed into a pit. He can't do anything about it. He's betrayed. He's pushed into a pit, wrongly so, but nevertheless, he's in a pit. There's nothing he can do. He has to submit to the pit. Have you noticed this, uh, this, this just happens in life? Like Joseph wasn't planning on being in the pit. And if you've been following Jesus or you've been breathing oxygen for any amount of time, you know, it's true. I think in life, pit happens. Right? Pit happens. But what Joseph does is in the pit, he could have become pitiful and replayed why they pushed him in. What did I do? What they did or didn't do. And that's what happens to us. It's in our journey. We have a struggle. Maybe somebody wrongly uses us, slanders us, talks about us. I don't know. Pushes us, betrays us. Um, we can begin to replay that and we get stuck. We get stuck. Some people can be stuck 10, 20 years replaying 
what someone should have done or didn't do. And they get hung up and stuck in the pit. But it's a, it's a matter of, of surrendering. It's saying, God, I'm going to choose to forgive them. I'm going to let it go because I'm not staying here for them. It's hard, but I, I've got to surrender this to you. The outcome of this situation, I'm surrendering it to you. I, I've got to surrender my future. I've got to surrender my destiny. I've got to surrender my dream, my desires. You know, I, I think we have to surrender that to God. Um, marriage, marriage can be a struggle. Can I have a better Amen. Isn't it amazing how God puts you together with somebody who's not wired just like you? And it's a good thing. Because that helps you develop patience, long-suffering, kindness, forgiveness. But we've got to surrender that to God. When you have children, you love your children, but children can be a struggle. They can be a struggle, and even when you're doing everything right, they can still make mistakes, but it's okay. We have to surrender our children to the Lord. Turning point, this vision, this dream that God gave me to, to start a life-giving church on the south side of Atlanta, as we stepped out not knowing what we're doing, and sometimes still don't, but we're still believing God, and, and, and there's a struggle, and I've had, had to have those times and those moments where I say, God, I realize it's not on me, so I surrender this vision to you. This is your church. This is your vision. These are my children. They're yours. This, is, this marriage is yours. I came into this thing with nothing. And everything that I have is because of you. And you're going to sustain it. It's not up to me. So I surrender it to you. I surrender the outcome. I surrender to the process even when it's hard. I've got to do what he says. So if you're in a struggle today, surrender it to God. See, sometimes we think that because there's a struggle or because there is resistance, that it's an indicator that we're going the wrong way. Some of you stepped across the line of faith and started following Jesus, and all hell broke loose in your life. And you're thinking, what happened? You stepped into your purpose, and now the enemy's trying to come against you to cause you to turn back. But I want to tell you today, there's nothing for you to go back to. You're not called to go back to Egypt. God's called you to a land of abundance. But you got to walk through the wilderness. And we, we, we've got to realize that just because there's, there's resistance doesn't mean that I'm going in the wrong direction. Many times, it's an indicator that I'm going in the right direction. That's why Paul said, I press toward the mark. I've got to trust in the process. It reminded me of a story I heard a long time ago about a little boy who found a cocoon. And uh, he brought it in the house. And he noticed it started to move a little. So he brought his mom, he's like, mom, look, look, check this out. And so the butterfly begins to break out. And this goes on for several minutes, and, and it seemed like the butterfly got stuck. And so in his compassion, he was like, oh, I'm going to help this little guy out. So he breaks open the rest of the way. He just breaks open the cocoon. Butterfly comes out, fla flaps for a couple of moments, and then just kind of falls on one side, and he's at, he has that one wing thing going. And eventually... He doesn't fly at all. Eventually he dies, and the boy doesn't understand. He's like, Mom, what happened? I don't understand. Why, why would God let this happen? She says, son, what you don't understand is God created the cocoon to be a struggle, that in the process of the struggle, the butterfly's wings would be strengthened so that he could fulfill his purpose in flying. And you short-circuited the process. How many of you know there are no shortcuts to your destiny? There are no shortcuts to your purpose. The enemy will try to get you to take shortcuts, but there are no shortcuts in the kingdom of God. The devil came to Jesus and tried to get him to take a shortcut. He said, if you'll bow down to me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. What was he doing? He was saying, Jesus, you don't have to go to the cross. If you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you control. But Jesus knew there was only one purpose for which he came. He said, no, I don't want what you have for me, devil. I've came to fulfill my Father's will. I must go to the cross. It's the only way. And then I'm going to take back all authority. Then I'm going to come down to hell, kick open the, the doors of, of hell, and I'm going to take the keys back from you. There are no shortcuts. So I've got to surrender. I've got to do hard things. Because doing hard things prepares me to do great things. So we see he's in the pit. He gets sold into a place where he's a slave to Potiphar. So he goes. 
And Potiphar represents this. If, if Pitt re represents surrender, Potiphar represents, number two, stay faithful to God. Stay faithful. God doesn't need you to be perfect. God's not going to judge you based off what you didn't do. He's going to judge you based off of your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. Stay faithful to God. Joseph, if anybody could have got bitter, wasn't it my man Joe? Like all I did was serve you, God. I got pushed in the pit. Now, now, I'm, a, now I'm a slave. I don't want to be here. But you don't see that. He decides to create an atmosphere to bring his best version of himself to. So he, he stays faithful to God. It was probably hard being faithful over Potiphar's stuff. It was tough. It was a challenge. I'm sure he wanted to quit. God, you gave me a dream and this wasn't it. See, sometimes even when you obey God's instruction, you're going to have struggles. You're, you're going to take steps and it's not going to look like what you thought it was. You can make a plan and that's good. See, tell the president I'll call him right back. Um, I'm preaching right now. <laughs> so, 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 I don't even know where I, where I was. But anyway, so, <laughs> Joseph is doing hard things. He wants to quit. He's being faithful. I'm sure he wanted to quit. He could have gotten bitter. But he made a decision. I'm going to stay faithful to God. I'm going to get better. It's like, you know, there comes a point where we have to say, am I going to believe what I see? Or am I going to believe what God said? Because sometimes what you see doesn't match up to what he said. That's what faith is. That's why we walk by faith, not by sight. Because you can do the right thing and still not see what he said. But if you keep doing what he said, you'll see what he said. It's a process and a promise. I mean, there have been days where, honestly, I thought about quitting Turning Point. I thought, God, I could, just, I could just go into coaching and consulting. I don't need all this. I didn't sign up for this. This is not easy. I tell church planners today, hey, you want to go plan a church? It's the hardest gig on the planet. You better know you heard God's voice because there are going to be times that you want to quit and turn ship. And it's like that in life. But thank goodness I've had great voices in my life. Thank goodness I've had great people like you praying for me and standing with me. I'm so thankful that I didn't quit. Because thousands of lives now have been impacted for the glory of God. So don't quit even when it gets hard. Don't you step down. It's in the struggle. i got to stay faithful. And, 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 and I want to just say this because sometimes we start serving the Lord. And it gets hard, and, and we quit, and, and we step down. And I thought, you know, I think that's one of the enemy's goals. In servant leadership is to get us to have a confession of, I'm stepping down. God has never, God's never called us to step down. He's called us to step up by faith. And it's not easy, and it's not convenient. That's why we have to take up our cross and follow him. That's why we have to deny ourselves. And even when it's hard, stay faithful to the God who saved us. He went to the cross and shed his blood for me. I got to stay faithful. So, so he stays faithful. And he starts serving in this house, Potiphar's house. And he's, he's so good at what he does. He's got a gift for administration. And, and his gift made room for him. But he had to be faithful where he was. And, and so eventually Potiphar puts him in control of the whole house. And the Bible says that Potiphar's house prospered. Think about that. He was faithful with Potiphar's stuff. And Potiphar's house prospered. And so when Potiphar's house prospered, guess what? So did Joseph. It was hard. It was difficult. And it reminded me of when we are God's sons and daughters in the earth that he's entrusted us with his stuff, the time we have, the talents and skills we have, the treasure, the resources that we get to enjoy. They're all from God. Every one of you have a spiritual gift. 
And the Bible says to serve one another well with your gift. That is the body of Christ. We are to serve each other in love. We're to serve our world in the name of Christ. We're called to be servant leaders. That if you want to be great, become a servant. The greatest among you is a servant. Be a servant. So we want to be faithful to steward that gift. Not prostitute that gift to benefit ourselves. But to offer that gift up to the Lord to benefit his kingdom and his house. The resources that I'm entrusted with. I bring the first tenth into his house so that his house vision can be advanced. Hear what I'm saying to you today. Because here's what I've learned over the last 23 years. Is when I commit to making sure that I'm stewarding the stuff in God's house. So that God's kingdom and his house prospers. My house will prosper. Just like Joseph. Joseph made sure Potiphar's house prospered. And see that's why when we give and become a part of a local church. We're investing and saving. We're, 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 we're helping the life-saving message of Christ go out. And it's never a waste. Let me tell you this. It's never a waste when you use your time, talent, and treasure investing in the local church. The enemy will tell you that it's a waste. Haters will tell you that it's a waste. People who don't know what you know will tell you it's a waste. People who have ta not tasted what you have tasted. People who have not seen what you've seen. Because sometimes you can see things they don't see. So you better not listen to the wrong voices. Because they will get you out of position. And you will miss the blessing and the purpose of God's process. It's going to get hard. But it's good. Come on, it's good. Advancing his kingdom. So he's honoring and then check this out. He um, gets approached by Potiphar's wife. Now, I'm, I'm assuming Potiphar's a guy who's probably got influence. He's probably got money. More than likely, his wife was a hottie. I'm just saying. She probably wasn't looking after spiritual stuff. She's probably looking after power and, and, and stuff like that. But she gets her eye on Joseph, that Hebrew hunk. And here she is, Miss, Miss Egypt, 2000 B.C. She gets, she gets her eye on Joseph, and she's like, mm-hmm. Oh, mm, wow, yeah. And so she goes after him, and Joseph's like, no, I can't do that. He's, all, he's honoring the Lord. And one day she comes and grabs him and says, you better come. And he turns and runs away from her. She rips off his cloak, and all he's doing is running, like the Bible says, flee from sexual immorality. I can't do this against my God or my master. And so she went to her husband and said, look, that Hebrew tried to rape me. And Joseph never opened his mouth. Now he goes to prison. All he's doing is obeying the Lord. Because see, even when we obey, it doesn't mean we're not going to go through a struggle. And it doesn't mean that God has forgotten you or that God has forsaken you. It just means that God is working something out that you can't see. So stay faithful. So he, he, he keeps moving. He's moving. Everybody say he's moving. He's moving. 13 year, 13 year struggle. He's 17. Now he's moving into his third phase. 13 years of struggle. You know, the Bible says to be still and know that he is God. And sometimes we think that means to stop, do nothing. But be still actually means to relax. It doesn't mean to be still and stop moving. God has one direction for your life, forward. That's why be still means I'm going to relax. I'm not trying to make it happen in my own power, my own strength. I'm going to be still, but I'm going to keep moving. I'm going to keep doing what I know to do. He kept being faithful. So now he moves into a prison. <laughs> and he becomes the lead trustee. They give him the keys to the prison. Everywhere he went, the favor of the Lord followed him. And there comes a day where there's two guys in there, a baker and a butler, and he sees that they're sad, the Bible says. And he goes to them and asks about their situation, and he uses his gift to interpret, to serve them and help them. Even in prison, like, I know we have bad days, but I would imagine every day in prison is probably an opportunity for a bad day. I mean, one night was enough for me to go, yeah, I don't, I don't belong here. This is not where I belong. So Joseph could have been just down. But even in prison, he was looking for opportunities to serve. Even in the struggle, here's your point three. Continue to serve people 
in the middle of your struggle. That's what you were saved for. And sometimes we get bitter. We, we stop moving. We stop serving. We run away from God. We run away from church. Listen, when you go through the struggle, the last thing you want to do is run away from God or church. Can I hear a better amen? You want to lean into it. Why? Because this is only a test. This is only a moment of the process. And the thing you need most is God and the people of God. So he began to serve. And I think about my own life. I was in pain. I was coming out of addiction. I was coming out of busted relationship. Hurting. Started realizing all the things in my life that were wrong and came to church. Wasn't sure if God still loved me or could forgive me. But I had an opportunity to get involved. And so I started serving at church and I started getting involved in the outreach. And it was amazing. When I went out to focus on other people that were hurting, somehow I stopped thinking about my problems and my junk. And as I focused on helping somebody else's world be awesome... I noticed something. It triggered God to begin to make my world awesome. Because what you make happen for others, somebody help me. God makes happen for you. And sometimes we sit in our pain and our struggle and our dysfunction and we get stuck. And the enemy says, nobody understands you. Don't do anything. Nobody appreciates you. But that is the time to get on your feet, to put your hand to the plow and not look back and keep on loving people, keep encouraging people, keep serving people, keep reaching out to people because when you do, it springs forth your healing in your own life. Quit trying to figure out why God let you down, why your marriage didn't work, why you lost your job or why a person died. I don't know, but I know if there was an injustice, God will take care of it. And if I don't understand, I didn't need to know. I can trust in his goodness. I'm going to keep serving. I'm going to quit thinking that God let me down. No, I'm going to get into alignment with God. And I'm going to continue to serve. I'm going to stay faithful. I'm going to surrender. Because I realize when I'm faithful to the baker and the butler, God gives me a place to serve in the Pharaoh. See, God is faithful. Never forget the God who sees you always has the power to bless you. So we see, let, let me just wrap this up. Our time is done. Genesis 50. Joseph is in this place where he's serving the Pharaoh. And his brothers need food because the world is starving. Joseph had this incredible plan to save the world. He was a master administrator, had the wisdom of God. And so his brothers come to get food for their family, and they don't recognize Joseph. And remember, he's 30 years old now. They hadn't seen him since he was 17. He's all in, you know, he's got the, 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 the garb, the royal garments on. He's a ruler. He's in Egypt. They have no idea. And they find out that it's Joseph, and they start freaking out, thinking that he's going to kill them. But Joseph, when he had the power to crush them, showed compassion to them. Because he realized, you know what? You guys did me wrong. But I'm not God. I can't punish you. Somebody needs to know and remember that vengeance belongs to the Lord. If something wrong happened, let him work it out. He, he, he knows how to handle it. He said, you intended to harm me. But God intended it to help me. He did this so that I could help save many lives. Can I Just remember, in your struggle, in hindsight, I can see that the things I went through made me who I am. But the struggles I went through weren't even really about me or the person that did it to me. Ultimately, it was about God and the people that I could help. And what you're going through, you're going to go through. And when you go through it, you're going to get something so that you can turn around and then help other people who are going through what you went through. And you can give them hope to help them know, you know what, you can come through this. If I made it through this, don't you know? Now watch this. Are y'all having fun? Thank you for a few more minutes. I know people just stay with me for another moment. They pushed him into a pit. It was a cistern. It was called a, a cistern or a well at Dothan. Dothan, watch this, means double feast or double blessing. 
See, Joseph didn't get pushed into a pit. He really got pushed into a promotion. Double blessing. And God eventually gave him double for his trouble. See, some of you may have thought you got pushed into a pit, but really, you got pushed into a promotion. And what looked like a setback is really a set up. And if you'll realize today that God's with you, he's going to work this thing out. He's going to turn it around for your good and his glory. You're going to get double for your trouble in Jesus' name. So we live in a world now where there's so many people that are down. People are discouraged. That's why at Turning Point, when you come here, we want to lift you up. We don't want to beat you up. Some people struggle with that. It's like beat people up about their sin. No, they know what they've done. They're here for healing. They're here for hope. They're here to be encouraged. Not leave worse than when they came. That's the Holy Spirit's job to convict them. My job is to preach truth and love them where they are, but to give them hope. And there's so many people that are down, and that's the thing I love is we have an opportunity, church, to just simply lift other people up. Let's don't stay down in the pit. Let's decide we're going to get up. And even if we're in a pit, even if we're in a place where we don't want to be, perhaps, or maybe we feel like uh, uh, we've been, an injustice has taken place, wherever we are, we're going to serve in your school at your place of work. Be a lifter. Be an encourager. So much opportunity. And really, that's what we do every week as the dream team. So I don't know if you've ever thought about being on the dream team, but I'm going to be real plain and clear with you. We have an incredible opportunity, Turning Point, to make a huge difference in our generation. There are so many people right now that, that need the love and the grace and the encouragement of Jesus Christ. And every Sunday we have the opportunity to touch every person that comes to those doors, whether it's on a camera, whether it's at the soundboard, whether it's on the prayer team, whether it's in children's ministry, admin, security, it doesn't matter. We all have an opportunity to do that. And I just want to know, maybe if you will help, it looks like, oh, y'all got it covered. No, we're planting churches and we want to plant more campuses. And we want to do more things, but it requires that we all grab a hold of this vision and say we're going to be faithful to steward God's house. We're going to be committed to advancing God's purpose and what God loves in the earth. And let me just say, God wants you to be a part of that. And it's a great way to invest your life. And that's not some veiled way to get you to do something. Listen, I'm telling you, this will change your life. And you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be committed to lifting and loving people. So that means when people are down, like, for instance, can I ask you to stand with me just real quick? I'm just going to lift you up. God loves you, has a purpose for your life. God's got gifts and grace for you. You're, you're so awesome, so amazing. God's got good things for you. So just stay standing, stay standing. Or I could go here and say, hey, come on up, man. You don't have to stay down. Come on, God's got great things for you. You just, just be encouraged. Know that he's got a purpose. He loves you. There's joy for you. There's healing for you. So just stay up, just stay up. So... I go around, listen, man, you don't have to stay down. I know you may have had a struggle. Somebody betrayed you, but listen, God's got good things for you. Be encouraged. There's gifts inside of you. There's joy for you. There's love. There's purpose. You be, be encouraged. So stay up. So I'm going to keep coming over here. Here's another person. I'm just going to encourage them. Lift them up. Listen, I know you've been through some stuff, man. God's not forsaken you. He's not forgotten you. He's got good things for you. Stand strong in the Lord. Keep standing. Keep standing. Can I ask you to stand? God loves you. He's got healing for your life. There's love that he has for you. There's joy. There's purpose. There's a plan. So be encouraged today. Keep serving the Lord. Keep trusting the Lord. So keep standing. You see what I did? I lifted people. Just lift people. Just love people. Just encourage people. That's what we're about at Turning Point. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn and lift two or three people around you. Would you do that? Now that you've been lifted, the people that are standing... Would you lift other people around you? And when you're lifted up, turn around and help somebody else up. Once you're lifted up, turn around and help somebody else up. Do you see that? This is, look, this is the purpose of the church right here. It's a group of imperfect people just committing to serving and loving people where they're at. We're not trying to judge them. We're not trying to tell them what they should do or not. We're going to love them where they are. We're going to encourage them. Come on, there's still people sitting. If there's people sitting, we still have a mission. We still have a mission. Look at that. There are people, no one should be sitting. Everybody should be standing. 
Everybody should know that we don't win until we all win. That there are still people out there who need us to go from this place and lift them up and point them to Jesus. And know today that I'm just going to surrender the process. I don't understand it, but I know that He is good. And I'm going to stay faithful. I will not allow pain. I will not allow the devil to stop me from serving and loving people. I'm going to keep serving. I'm going to keep giving. I'm going to keep praying. I'm not going to turn back. I'm going to continue to serve people where they're at, even in my pain. I'm going to serve them even when I don't feel like I've got it figured out. Even when I'm hurting, I'm still going to bring love. I'm still going to bring encouragement. I'm going to mess the devil's head up. I'm not going to stop loving. I'm not going to stop giving. I'm not going to stop believing. I'm going to endure because the struggle is pulling me to my destiny. The struggle is bringing me to the place of victory. If you believe it today, can you lift your hand?